Most of you have been out here visiting our house here. Well, it's still nice and warm and cozy. It's 33 degrees outside, according to Alexa. And uh, so we're all doing well here and uh, rejoicing, and especially to be able to get together with our brothers and sisters on this day. Uh, I would like to um, share something from, even from that song we sang earlier about uh, as the deer. I want to take that particular Psalm 42. If you have a Bible, if you'll turn there, just want to uh, talk about this wonderful Psalm and some of the things that we might glean from it today. Psalm 42 is written to the chief musician. And in my Bible being capitalized, I assume that means written to God himself, <clears throat> a mascal of the sons of Korah. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? These things I remember, and pour out my soul within me. How I went with the throng, and led them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise, a multitude keeping holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore do I remember thee from beyond the Jordan, from Hermon's heights to Mizar's hill. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water brooks. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and the night his song shall be with me, even a prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine adversaries reproach me, while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the help of my countenance and my God. Dear Lord, there are times when we have to come directly to you. And in such an hour, we find you're instructing us by a spirit deep within. Do teach us, Lord, of larger things in these days in which we live. We thank you that we could be joined together in such a wonderful and miraculous way. Now help us to understand some of the wisdom that is found in this precious song. We pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. So it turns out it was a Roman poet named Sextus who first came up with the famous line, separation makes the heart grow fonder. And uh, we all know that this is expressed here in the Psalm in verse 4, where it says, These things I remember and pour out my soul within me, how I went with the throng and led them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, a multitude keeping holy day. Boy, how the songwriter was missing those days in the house of God. Separation does indeed make the heart grow fonder, doesn't it? Uh, Julie and I just got back from Costa Rica, and we were missing our sons and uh, their daughters, some in North Carolina, some in New York, but we got together in Costa Rica. It took us about three days to remember why getting together sometimes could be a bit tricky. But until that time, boy, we, we were looking forward to getting together. And anyway, when we flopped down finally on the seat of the plane heading home, we said, man, that was a good time. When indeed it was. And our times together, which we usually avail of on Sundays and gather together are really wonderful. Even this time today, indeed, was a very wonderful time. And we think of this as David, we believe, uh, the rabbis say that David probably penned this, uh, these words at a time when he was in exile from Jerusalem because of his son Absalom. This tragic division, this 
family squabble has caused the division and caused the, an exile and caused him to be far, far away from all those things that were in God and that he loved. And so he was crying out and remembering how wonderful it was to be with the throngs. So we find David, of course, the wonderful worshiper of God. And we know that the Jews worshiped in ways quite similar to ours from that simple verse, uh, perhaps a little more physical, a little bit more joy, a little bit more singing, but dancing around perhaps, uh, leading the throng, you know, all this kind of thing. Uh, they had times of singing, sometimes great processions and joy. You know, it's funny how we always re remember in separation the good times. You know, not the time that the cantor is off tune singing or the time that the rabbi is a little long-winded, you know. When we think of all oh, the times we were together, we think of, you know, the, the Christmas caroling we did or the songs of resurrection around Easter, or special times of love feasts and when our hearts, or even times, special times when we were worshiping and our hearts came in touch with heaven. Praise God for such wonderful times. Those are the times that make our hearts break as we remember what a wonderful time it was to be together. And of course, we're only a few weeks into this kind of temporary separation, we hope, a temporary separation. And yet already, I think we can sense the separations making our hearts grow fonder. I wish I could hear, you know, we have in our gathering a special secret embedded choir of full-hearted singers, even, even including Ray, though he's a little off pitch. He's certainly full of heart, you know, and uh, these singers make worship together such an easier thing. And of course, we got Sammy's beats usually going, which we kind of miss today, you know, with his whacking the drum and, and even Lisa really whacking the drums. And and Abe, now, now Abe is, you know, what, what is he? he? He plays keyboard with his right hand and guitar with his left. And I expect he'll be kicking a, a monkey bass drum on the with his foot pretty soon. The guy just does everything, but makes our worship so wonderful, especially all those jazz chords I don't recognize. You know, it makes me fond and remember the times of separation and times when somebody prayed a prayer that verbalized just exactly what I was thinking, trying to say. And times when somebody broke up with a tearful heart, full of praise. And then the times that we, we come in empty, we hear some songs, we go out full. And there's even wonderful distractions uh, in the times when things are going slow. You know, I, I love to watch it. It's a phenomenon to watch Weber's kids slithering through the chairs uh, throughout the whole worship time. It's really quite amazing. Or, Counting the times, our special jackrabbits hop up, and run to the back, and then come back to their seats 10 minutes later, do that two or three times in one session. That's really incredible. And to hear the, the hum of constant baby coos and cries in the background, watching uh, heads bobbing up and down with our worship nappers, nappers during the whole time. They, all of these things I, I grow fond of. I love looking around seeing the saints. It's a wonderful time. But this time has been given to us as well, these times of separation, to take some spiritual inventory. And that's why I just want to focus a few things from this uh, simple psalm. It's called a maskil, And in Hebrews, that means it's a song especially dedicated for instruction and for wisdom. Now, evidently, as best we understand, uh, the, son, the sons of Korah actually penned the tune, and David wrote the words. David had the experience of the separation, but the dear sons of Korah knew just how to rewrite the song and put it in a tune and in a rhythm that made it, it, made it flow in the spirit. And the, the sons of Korah, a special lesson to us, because they had that longing in their heart that this whole psalm expresses and it comes out of their very family life. Now, you remember how Korah was one of the Levites, and uh, 250 of them had rebelled against Moses in the wilderness. And Korah was, the earth opened up and took Korah away. And so Korah's family was without job and without profession for a long time. They were like persona non grata until David came along. And he showed mercy to the sons of Korah. And he commissioned them to write songs, the, even this song of wisdom, along with many others. 
And so they found a place back in the house of God, a place they once had as keepers of the gate. And uh, now their hearts, whenever you read a, a song of Korah, you, you sense something very precious in their longing to worship their wonderful God. But this song is more than just a psalm, more than just a complaint or a psalm of yearning. It is indeed a song with a lesson in it. And for us, at least I want to just point out one major lesson, and it's this. The lesson is how to get your exhausted soul out of depression and back into God. Just gonna to touch on three things in this Psalm. There's a lot more to it. But the first is simply this. When the soul is dominating, it leads to a disconnect from our spirit and even from the Lord above that's too heavy to bear and we become depressed. And then to see in a simple way how the spirit brings correction to our soul, brings us back into light and reconnects us with the living God who had never gone far away, though David thought he'd been abandoned. And then third, just to note, of course, that the grace of God was bringing David through this deeper lesson, even near the end of his life. These lessons of moving in the times and the seasons as God makes all things beautiful out of our lives. So first, let's look at this matter as we see David crying out uh, from his soul's depression. Now we sing as a deer in a very wonderful, desirous way, even as the song is beautifully written and expresses our beautiful desire to know more of God. But actually, if you take a look honestly at the song, you'll see that this is written not by one abiding in a love which is drawing him further, but of one exhausted, whose soul has been worn down to the place where he's lost hold of God. He doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know where to find him. This is a psalm of desperation. Now, this just brings us to a very important point for us to realize. It's this. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Spirit, soul, and body wrapped in a trinity. And our soul and self, a complex trinity of thoughts, emotions, and will, which are brought back to health at our salvation. We see that Jesus, when he walked on this earth, kept a perfect balance of soul in such a way that as he walked, the enemy could not find anything to bring him down. It's when the enemy can grab something in our soul that he can bring us down. But Jesus could say, the prince of this world cometh unto me and has nothing in me to lay hold of. Well, now this should instruct us at least of one thing. The enemy is working 24 seven to attack us, to find something uncovered in us, something that's exhausted, overextended, some kind of decisions that have propelled a momentum without reference to the spirit or to the will of God or to the Trinity himself. And he'll find that hook on our soul and he'll grab onto it. So depression comes. When our soul's integrity, that is that abiding spirit, soul, and body, has been knocked out of position because our soul has taken the predominant place. And the enemy uh, lays on that soul because our souls, without spirit, without our body, in relationship, abiding in the Lord, is too heavy. And our souls become heavy. And this is depression. You often feel that with people who have problems with the depression. There, there's, there's people who are melancholic and deep, artistic, introspective. And you sense sometimes how heavy their souls are. Well, we really all need this balance because this psalm is written for all of us. There's not a type of temperament nor personality that doesn't get depressed. There are just some who recognize it. There are some who live in it. And there's some who deny it, but they're all there at the same time. But when our Lord, as we saw him walking on earth, once again, when we saw him work, he had such energy, such buoyancy, such patience in dealing with people, such power and resilience that we can see that he was dividing, the, residing in perfect triple Trinitarian balance. 
Now, outwardly, our times of exhaustion and depression may seem physical, but usually its roots are soulish. As an example, you know, if on a Sunday you, you taught the kids at Mangat and prepared your lesson and all, and you come home totally exhausted, maybe your soul is a little too heavy. If you go out socializing or you gather people over uh, or you have a time with family or times with others and you come home absolutely exhausted and depleted, your soul has been over-invested some, somehow. If you try now, as you've been separated and isolated, now you're trying to read the word and you're trying to pray and it's all in vain and your mind is wandering and you, even as Chet shared just those little tidbits, you know, he finds himself straining, trying to think about things. Maybe our soul's too heavily invested in busyness. You know what I'm saying? There's something the Lord's trying to teach us about, some deeper lessons of life. All these things we will find in this little psalm teaches us that there's a lifelong battle laying ahead for us. It's this battle to stay in the zone where the soul is compatible with spirit. And when the soul is abiding in the Lord himself, and we come to the place where we realize when our soul is drawing us out, because our soul is our big problem. It always is our big problem. So to discern the difference is the key. Now, there is physical expenditure in our lives, and some more than others, some jobs and some responsibilities entail great physical expenditures, which can be restored after a good, refreshing night's rest. But when there is a heavy soul, it adds a weariness to the physical which eludes sleep and causes increasing tiredness day by day. One, it just means that one of our soul's sheep has run away out of control. Now, what's our soul's sheep? Well, all I mean is, you know, the three-sided Trinitarian soul that we have. Uh, we have emotions. They go out of control. Uh, we become needy emotional, and our souls want approval. And we spend so much soul energy trying to gain that approval, we end up completely exhausted and, of course, lacking the final approval we desired. Or there are emotional overload that tries to get some elusive feeling, a feeling of love or a feeling of those worship goosebumps we once had or a feeling of outward happiness. But all of this searching for that feeling again leads to a dead end trail, or our emotions are, are our target of the enemy. He causes the, our, our, our uh, people who are so dependent on their emotions to come to the place where they just don't feel loved and don't know love, and, and they express all of this being overly emotional in worry. And worry leaks strength and loses joy. Now just think of a soul who's gotten out of round and the emotions are out of control. And even given this present circumstance, how worry can just pull the strength right out of us. But then you have the thinker's trap of those who are out of control. The mind is such a gift, but it's been tainted at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so our mind also involves our doubts, our pride, our respectability. And these things keep our soul from resting, resting in the joy of whom thou art. We enter a sort of a shadowy nether world of half faith. And as we learn from James, nothing uh, erodes our rest like half faith. The double-souled mind is unstable in all of his ways because he's been robbed as a thief from resting faith. A mind out of control cannot rest in faith. They experience setbacks and problems and immediately they try to analyze and overanalyze, but because they have no faith, there's no resistance, 
And, and, and the one who's like in such a trap cannot say, as David said, hope in God, or I shall yet praise him, because there's no way back for this unbelief, this sense of loss and doubt that overwhelms. And then, of course, the third lost sheep are for those who are strong-willed and out of control, and they keep doing and doing and spinning and doing, sometimes without wisdom, often without rest, and often unconnected to the Spirit of God and the will of God and the love of God and the grace of God. And so the willful eventually loses connection with others and find themselves all alone and independent and exhausted and weary. And of course, the willful person always has to deal with anger. Anger. And it's a, it's a friend that drains as it blames others. Oh, strong-willed people. Yes. And once uh, the will has tried and tried and tried to the point of exhaustion, they become paralyzed with depression, self-doubt, anger, emptiness, because disconnected from the spirit. Now, do you know, we all have to learn this lesson because all of us are out of whack. There's some part of each one of us that is, is out of balance. And the Lord has to let us drift us out into the far reaches beyond the Jordan sometimes to bring us back to the place that he wants us to be. And that's the whole point of this wonderful uh, psalm. We find it there in, in, in verse 5, the way back. And what's the way back? The Spirit finally speaks to the soul. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. So here's our first instruction to realize who's talking here. It's ourself talking to ourself, but really it's more than that. It's the Spirit led by the Holy Spirit within that's finally been given a voice and our soul is, is, is exhausted and depressed and finally willing to listen. So the Spirit within has been waiting for such a time. And David is so wonderful in his Psalms because he provides us honesty in every range of emotions, he takes all of these things, depressions and anger and hatred and frustration and exhaustion into the presence of God. And here, why art thou cast down? Hope in God. He's bringing these things into the presence. You know, David shows us that we're just humans. We're going to mull over things. We're going to worry about things. We're going to be angry about things. We're going to try to get out of our own problems doing and doing. But the wonderful thing about David is his final recourse is he always comes back to his life in the presence of God. He was, after all, an artistic man, a melancholic man. And just as he had great heights as a leader and a champion, so he also had great, great depths of despair. We've all known people who are quite like that. And David certainly was one. But he's acknowledging something. He's acknowledging that his thirst is really his deep love for God. You know, a lot of times our parched longings and desperations really are born of something wonderful. The Lord has done something with us, but we have lost the way back to realizing that we're thirsting after God. And we, we, he, David got to the place, he got so dry, he kind of panicked. He said, well, where are you, God? As if God had moved, as if God had left him, said, I'm going somewhere. Well, where are you, God? I can't find you anymore. And I, I'm just, he looked around. And when he looked around, all he could remember were the good times that he had. And, the, he, he, and then he looked around and he saw the bad times that were around. And he looked around and he saw the naysayers say, yeah, yeah, where is your God? And he looked around everywhere but within where the spirit of God was waiting, was speaking. So even these good memories of being together in the assembly with all the saints and enjoying themselves, even that took on a kind of nostalgic uh, negative tone to it. 
as he was so depressed that he was far away. But we see, we see in verse six, if you look at it, that there's a very wonderful and subtle uh, change halfway through and some wisdom to be learned. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, do I remember thee from beyond the Jordan, from Hermon's heights to Mizar's hill. Now, he's not complaining. He's talking to God and bringing his complaints. Ah, that's a wonderful thing. And now his memories, he changes from memories of, of outward things to memories of the Lord. He says, now, now he's beyond the Jordan. He's, he's away in exile. And as he goes up to Hermon's Heights now, he says, I remember you in the Hermon's Heights. And Mizar's Hill is some small hill over far in the far northeast. But even on small Mizar's Hill, now he's remembering the Lord here. He's seeing the Lord there. He's starting to see the Lord in his circumstances, in his isolation, as he's together in hiding with his family. So, of course, something subtly has happened here. The Lord has begun walking with David and with us during this separation and trials. And that's a lot different. But now how, how did this, how did he get shaken back toward the soul balance through which he would eventually find his rest? How did he, how did the Lord bring him back from an overwrought heavy soul? Well, we discovered that something happened it just had to bottom out. And it's called this matter of deep calling unto deep in verse seven. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water brooks. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Something happened during his exile. Something happened during his exhaustion and his depression. But he, and, and what's happened is he gets overwhelmed. But when he gets overwhelmed, he discovers God in this overwhelming, that it was God who has brought him to this depth. So he speaks of this. Uh, some interpret this as being a disaster. He goes from one disaster to another disaster, and all, everything overflowed me, and uh, you know, all of these billows are overwhelming. But you know, something happened in the midst of this anguish as he was tossed about. Deep called unto deep. He began to see and touch something of the anguish of God for us. This deep that was, he was touching, as he was being overwhelmed by these billows, is just something of the deeps that Jesus touched in his anguish. But he realized the Lord is with him in the belly of the whale. The Lord is with him in the whelming flood. And the spirit within, he discovered, is able to bear buoyantly in its depths and even respond with faith. Deep called unto deep. In the depth of his distress, something spoke to his heart. Something spoke deep within and began to bring his soul back in the balance. And so we find the that faith and mercy begin to be restored in trials. And the integrity of his soul now, now begins to abide by the power of the Spirit within God. And so we find in verse 8, Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night his song shall be with me, even a prayer unto the God of my life. David has come to see that his whole life is a prayer, that his depression has been brought on and brought through by the Lord God. Oh, how the Lord wants to save us from ourselves. He is alone, and yet no longer alone. Isn't that wonderful? Because now, whether he's walking the heights of Hermon or the hills of Mizar, he's walking with the Lord. And his his abiding in the Lord once again begins to strengthen his soul with faith. Hope in God. I, I will yet praise him for the countenance and his help. He, he can see like a light at the end of the tunnel. 
even as he's abiding through the troubled times. And you know what? I'll be honest with you. The truth of this dialogue goes on and, and the twice more as the, toward the end of the Psalm, of course, and even Psalm 43, which most believe is a continuation of actually of Psalm 42. He keeps coming back to this, why art thou disquieted within me? Why are you allowing your, your, your soul to roar at you? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the countenance and his strength. So these are times when we're apart. But it is a precious time to do the one thing that obviously this season is calling us to do, and that is to spend precious one-on-one -on -one with God. Our gatherings are wonderful. We appreciate them so much. But there's no gathering that can be a substitute for your personal love, tryst, and relationship to God. And sometimes he's got to do some rather severe things to kind of shake us up and to bring us to the place where we realize that our life is definitely and decisively lived as we abide in him. You know, it's the salvation of our soul that the spirit is working toward. That separation from all those things that make our soul so heavy, that caused our souls to invest so much unnecessary strength in things which a spirit-filled life is able to do with the buoyancy of the life of Christ. So I just wanted to uh, speak this little message to all the deers who are a little bit desperate perhaps and running around looking for the next source and what I'm going to do. We're, we're all so very outward. And, and there we were looking for a little draft of water and suddenly find ourselves overwhelmed with a flood of the Lord. And in the midst of the flood, we find reconnection. And the, soul, and the Lord still loves us. He loves us spirit, soul, and body, every one of us. And he's training us in these days. So may the Lord bless you. Let's just pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the rest of faith. When we can just cast our all upon you. And in such a time as presently we're separated from one another. Oh, how the heart grows fonder as we remember and think of all the dear ones in our midst, all the young and old. It's so wonderful to be in God's house and be worshiping as with God's people. But Lord, now this must be a season where you want us to find you one-on-one -on -one more deeply and not so dependent upon perhaps the faith and the instruction of others and the prayers of others and the worship of others, but somehow find our own priesthood as we're found out in the fields far away from the assembly of God. We pray, Lord, that you would bless all of us and make our eventual regathering, indeed, a feast of tabernacles, a time of rejoicing, a time where we can say, oh, Lord, you have been good to us. So teach us from those deeper drafts of water, the things we need to learn until this joyful time when we be able to meet again together. We pray and we thank you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.